This is Tamron's new 20 to 40 millimeter f2.8 lens for Sony E-mount. And if you would have asked me a couple years ago to describe my dream lens, on paper, this would be it. Let's get undone. Gerald Undone. He's crazy. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and it was me all along, Barry. For disclosure, Tamron lent me this lens to make this review. I don't get to keep it. No money changed hands, and Tamron does not get any input on this video's production or get to preview before it's posted. Essentially, I just wanted to try it for myself to see if I was gonna buy it, and I figured I'd share my thoughts with you along the way. I've had it for a couple weeks now. I took it with me to New York as my only glass to see how it felt as a walk around lens, and I've used it in a few other applications that I'll share with you a little later. I like the build quality of this lens and the handling. It balances nicely on the latest full frame Sony bodies. The rings are only lightly dampened, but they feel good to me, and I haven't noticed any barrel sag from gravity pulling out the zoom. Although this lens actually extends when going to 20 millimeters and is retracted at 40 millimeters. The only thing I don't like about the build is the lack of any switches. There isn't even an AF MF switch, so you're gonna have to do everything on the camera. The front filter thread is 67 millimeters and the lens weighs 365 grams. Tamron claims that it's moisture resistant and has several seals to prevent leaks throughout the barrel. And even the USB-C port is waterproof. Now I didn't use it in any extremely inclement weather, but I did have it in the rain for a while and it was perfectly fine. And speaking of the USB-C port, this is one of my favorite features of the new Tamron lenses, including that 35 to 150 millimeter lens that I adore. You can connect your lens to Tamron software very easily with just a cable without needing any kind of docks or adapters and adjust a bunch of valuable settings on your lens. The most important ones are the direction and linearity of your focus ring, as well as the throw. So you can make it completely linear and set the travel to 90, 180, or even 360 degrees, which makes manual focusing excellent on this lens. However, it's not par focal, meaning you don't keep your focus as you zoom. It's close, but it's not perfect. It's probably good enough that on a wide shot, you might not notice too much, but if you shoot anything close up or with a lot of detail, you can see that the focus is off after zooming. If you're using autofocus, this isn't a big deal as the VXD linear motors in this lens are fast enough to keep up with the changes in focal length unless you just crash zooming in and out like a madman, in which case this is not the lens for you. You can close focus down to 17 centimeters or 6.7 inches at 20 millimeters and 29 centimeters or 11.4 inches at 40 millimeters. This will give you a maximum reproduction ratio of approximately one to four and one to five respectively. So definitely not a macro lens, but you can get some reasonably interesting close focus shots at the wide end of the lens. Autofocus performs quite well. As I mentioned, these are Tamron's latest linear motors, so you can rack from minimum to infinity almost instantly. And the motors are smooth enough for use in video, but there is some focus breathing to be aware of. It's definitely not the worst I've seen, but it is noticeable in some shots. I recorded a tape measure here so you could get a sense of how much of the frame is moving as you rack focus. And the results are about the same at both ends of the zoom range, but the effect is different because of the magnification and field of view. And unfortunately, as far as I'm aware, there's no support for third-party lenses with Sony's focus breathing compensation, so you're stuck with the breathing as is. But let's put it on my main camera here and see if it poses an issue in talking head scenarios. Okay, this is a 20 mil, and then 40 mil, and then we'll pull back to 35. Okay, so this is that lens set to 35 mil. I showed you the 20 to 40 zoom range there ahead of time. I think this is close to the frame they had set up before. Uh, let's see how the focus breathing plays. If we can see it, if you just move around a little bit with talking head, it should be tracking my eye. If I move close. So it's not too bad. It seems like the breathing falls more on the really, really close end. If I get up close, let's see. Yeah, so it breathed there. So if you're at a reasonable distance, then these movements shouldn't be too distracting in the frame. I, like I do see it move a little bit, but it's not as bad as like when I had the 35G Master on, if I did this, it, you know, the whole frame was like coming in and out. So that's not too bad. Uh, one thing I, I am noticing though is obviously I had to bump the ISO. I'm, I normally shoot on the 35 1.8 and I shoot it at f2.2. So I had to bump the ISO and I noticed that even in New York when I was walking around. In fact, the last time I was in New York, I was using a 20 millimeter. It was the F1.8 uh, Prime from Sony. And there's a big difference in that one and a third stops. I'm telling you, when you go out in the evening or nighttime, you, like the 2.8, I kept having to jack up the ISO and the shots were noisier and stuff like that. So, uh, but I mean, overall, this is uh, this is fine. This, this would work, you know, this is okay. It's adequate. I said a little bit higher ISO. 
I don't love that, uh, like at 2.2, I find the background gives me more separation. I can go all the way to 1.8. 2.8 on 35 at this distance, the background's there. Like it's, it's only slightly out of focus. So I don't think I would use it for this shot. I think I prefer to shoot it, like I said, F2, F2.2, somewhere in that zone. But it looks good as far as image quality and color. And, and again, the focus breathing isn't too bad and the autofocus is doing well to smoothly uh, stick to my eye. So performance wise, it's great. It just comes down to taste, whether you need more separation or you know, you want to expose differently. All right, let's talk about image quality. I've got some choice samples here in Lightroom to go over. These first two are just to give you a representation of the difference between 20 millimeter and 40 millimeter. This was more to talk about distortion. It, I've noticed that when I was shooting sort of like architectural stuff in New York, that there is a lot of distortion, which I didn't find as bad on my 20 mil prime, but there aren't correct lens correction profiles yet for this lens. So, you know, I can try and match, I can try to do my own distortion correction in Lightroom and it works, but I just wanna let you know that there is some weird stuff going on uh, as it currently stands. So you're gonna have to do that manually if you wanna fix it. Uh, same with here, just like look at the windows. It's not so bad at 40 mil, but I would say from 20 to 30, it exists. This one was at 30 mil actually. And then I did some portraits, goofy portraits with uh, iPhone Do to sort of be able to get a look at the, the bokeh in the background, but also see, you know, what the eye sharpness looks like and that kind of thing. So this one was at 40 mil. And this also goes to show the magnification differences. And I believe these are both somewhat close focus, like about as close as I get the autofocus to grab the eye. So this is 40 mil, we can punch in. And this is what the autofocus orbs look like. And also, yeah, reason. I, I, nothing about this lens screams super sharp, but it's it's okay. Like they're all sort of like reasonably sharp, but it's not like 35 millimeter G Master sharp kind of thing, you know. Uh, but we'll get into more sharpness detail in a minute. But this is okay. And then at 20 mil, obviously, it's a much different perspective. That distortion comes into play now. I would say at 40 mil, it's not really that distorted at all. It kind of almost looks natural. But then here, we're getting a you know a different look. It still managed to be quite quite sharp and decent on the eye there, which I like. And I would say the bokeh is about the same, except for at 20 mil, we can start to see the blades a little bit more in the autofocus areas. Both of these were at 2.8. So this is as big and you know round as the orbs are gonna get uh, on this lens. And then, I don't know what this one is. Is this anything? I think maybe I was messing around with flare. I have mixed opinions regarding flare on this lens. It comes with a hood, which is good, because if you manage to catch some flare with this lens, it tends to be really, really, really strong. I did that test with the flashlight because people request it and whenever I don't do it, they go, why didn't you do that? Just insane flare. Uh, but sometimes I was shooting directly into the sun. I think I have an image here like this and it's extremely well controlled. The contrast reduction is, is only really kind of like isolated to this little zone here and we're really punchy for, I would say, you know, 85% of the frame. So that's great. Uh, but then I have a video clip of me, you know, moving around and then the flare comes back. So I don't, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Use the hood if you don't want it at all. Otherwise, take your chances. If you can avoid it by, you know, angle and light source, then the coating, this has the second gen coating on it, does an, does an extremely great job. But if you catch it just right, it's like nothing you've ever seen. <laughs> just like, whoo, like just layers and layers of artifacts and like ghosting and crazy prismatic effects or whatever. So I don't know, do with that what you want. It comes with the hood, use it, I'd recommend it. Now let's talk about chromatic aberration. There is some, uh, this is at 20 millimeter and you can definitely see that we go toward that, you know, blue as we go out of focus this way and a little bit more on the orange color as we come in this way. And at 40 mil, it's actually a little bit worse, I think. Yeah, like you can see the blue and that amber color here. Uh, and then if we shoot, this one is 40 mil looking for lateral chromatic aberration, which isn't as bad. This one you can obviously fix just by, you know, defringing, but there's a little bit there, but it's it's not too bad. But the loca, the previous one, where it goes from foreground to background, that one's harder to remove. You can really only remove by stopping down. But another reason for this shot was to talk about distortion. If you look at the outer edges here versus the center, we can see there is a little bit of distortion, not 40 mil, but it's not too bad. But at 20 mil, the distortion is much more pronounced as you can see in this sort of central area here. But there is a fall off in sharpness, which I've noticed. So let's go into around 150%. If you look at the 90, which is where I focused, and then look at the 60 and then the 30, it, it really starts to fall off. 
and out toward the edges, like we're pretty much <laughs> full soft over here. And it's not that much better at 40 mil. This is 40 as we move out toward the edges. There's 60. And then you can see significant reduction in sharpness as we move down. This is more of a controlled bokeh assessment here in the studio here with fairy lights. And I put them in the corners and we can see that they main at 40 mil, it maintains its shape at 2.8, even up into the corners, which is nice. And again, we're getting similar quality, just a little bit of onion ringing, a little bit of that outer membrane, but not too bad. But at 20 mil, we do start to cut into our shapes here in the in the edges and in the corners. And we can see just a little bit, like I said, of the blades. It's not completely circular. And this is at 2.8. As we stop down, this is at F4. We bring the circle back a little bit and we retain it a little bit better, but now obviously we're starting to see those blades. And then at F5.6, it's not really cut off at all anymore, but now we're really, we're basically looking at stop signs uh, for the bokeh at this point at F5.6. And then this is just to evaluate the sharpness and color. This is the 20 to 40 at 20 mil. And if we punch in right here, which is, I believe where I focus, let's go to around 200 or so percent. Looks pretty good, decently sharp. And then this is the Sony 20 millimeter at F2.8. This is the 1.8 lens though, stopped down to 2.8. And as you can see, it's obviously sharper. So if you have the prime, the 20 prime, you, you get a better result. If you flick back and forth, you can see that Sony, Tamron, Sony, it's a bit sharper. But color-wise, uh, if we do sort of a one of these type of zooms, the colors are pretty good. I would say, you know, mix and match, good color reproduction. It matches the Sony. But again, that sort of fall off toward the edge. So if we look at this chart over here on the right-hand side of the frame, this is the Sony 20 mil. And if we compare this to the Tamron, by my eye, the Tamron is definitely looking softer and darker. There's more vignetting too, it seems. Here's some sun stars for people who care about that. These are at F22. Chromatic aberration, not on a chart, but like outside. So this is a fence I normally use. Let me zoom out here so that we can see how the focus, you know, into the, into the background gets more blue and then more warm down here. You can see this one without even zooming in. Like this whole section of the fence has blue, blue fringing on it. And same with this shot, this area up here, you get significant blue and then it starts to get more yellow and amber down here. And then this one was just to see what about lateral on an actual object that's sort of backlit. And again, the fringing isn't too bad laterally, but there is some definitely right there. Uh, also to talk about flare a little bit, no flare. And then you, you just move slightly and then you get these like, like I said, strong sort of artifacts in your frame. But you wouldn't think that from here to here that all of a sudden you would have just Flare, that's why I'm saying just put the hood on because you never know. This one I might have shown for a second earlier in the video when we talked about macro reproduction. But it's interesting because this is 20 millimeter at f2.8 as close as you can focus. And I was aiming for this water droplet right here, which, you know, sharpness isn't too bad. I think that it, it did a decent job. None of these images are edited, by the way. These are just straight out of the camera. Yeah, it did, it did okay as far as sharpness. But you can also see some of the character of the lens here. If you're going to do close focus stuff at 20 mil, you get some very interesting swirly action going on here a little bit with the with the bokeh which is I think actually kind of creates an interesting effect like I said it's not as close as you can get with other lenses but at 20 mil you can make some interesting shots if you want I also tested this at home as my webcam lens I know some people think it's comical when I talk about using a full frame camera and lens combo as my webcam but I like it the a7-4's USB webcam functionality is great and I like the versatility I have in my small home office however I often can't get the field of view exactly right, so I thought this 20 to 40 millimeter would be perfect. Okay, so this is my normal webcam setup. This is the a7 IV with the 35 millimeter G Master set to 1.8, and this is the shot. And I have focus breathing compensation turned on, I think. Let me see. No, I have it turned off because it was already too tight at 35, so when I put on focus breathing compensation, because this lens breathes so much, it made it extremely tight. So that's the disadvantage of this one. I should just be using the 35 1.8 lens, but I'm using that one at the studio. Uh, so anyway, you can see the issue I'm having here. It's either too tight or it breathes. So let's try the Tamron and see how it does in this situation, but also pay attention to the background to you know how shallow the, the depth of field is because this isn't just my home office anymore. It's also the nursery and I'm trying to not, you know, make that as a parent in the shot without using those weird computational ones that you can get in the calls that just do a terrible job around your hair, but actually optically, uh, I think looks nicer. Okay, let's switch the lens. Okay, so at f2.8, obviously it's darker, 
versus 1.8. So we're gonna have to turn that up to, uh, we'll go with that. I think I'm at uh, ISO 1250 now. And it's not breathing too badly. We can just see a little bit over here on the plant when I move back and forth. But we also have more control over the zoom, obviously. So we can go wide, that's 20 mil. So this is the total sort of view of the nursery. And then, you know, 40 mil. That's what the, the 35 looks like with focus breathing compensation turned on. So it's too tight. But so now I can grab kind of the shot that I want. Now there isn't quite as much separation between me and the background though. That's the only problem. And at 2.8, you know, I mean, I can go even tighter to try and blur it a little bit more, but this is the best I'm gonna get. So really it just comes down to whether or not this is adequate for Zoom calls. It might be actually, you know, for the webcam uses that, that I have for it. This, this, this isn't too bad. It still kind of looks like a nursery, uh, but I like that I have a little bit more flexibility in the zoom and at the price it's pretty good i think for i don't know what other lens i'm going to put on here that can do all this for less which obviously for webcam i don't want to spend that much but it would be great if i could do like f2 on this lens but anyway this is what it looks like so to wrap up this lens is not the dream lens i'd hoped it'd be it's not a bad lens by any means and it's offered at a very reasonable price but the overall performance ranks at average or slightly above it can't really compete with the primes like the 20 millimeter f1.8 but it does offer a lot more versatility but for most areas like sharpness, chromatic aberration, bokeh, breathing, etc., it's a 7 out of 10 lens at best. Okay, maybe 8 out of 10 in some categories. I'm not sure if I'll buy it. I'm leaning towards no. I'd say that if you live in that focal range of 20 to 40 millimeters and you're okay with its shortcomings, then this lens could prove to be a useful option at a fair price. But I don't think that it can adequately replace 20 and 35 millimeter primes from your camera bag. Although it does have me wondering if Tamron could make a monster f2.0 version of this lens with the same impeccable quality of their 35 to 150. Now that, I definitely would buy. Yeah, all right. I'm done.